All right, we're going to get started. We can see everybody. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Courtney Speckman, and I am the Director of Education at the Buffalo and Erie County Naval and Military Park. Welcome to our virtual speaker series program, Dr. Mary Walker's Civil War with Dr. Teresa Kaminsky. I want to thank you all for joining us today on National Medal of Honor Day, which is celebrated each year on March 25th in honor of the first time it was awarded during the Civil War on March 25th, 1863. When Congress passed a resolution in 1990 establishing National Medal of Honor Day, March 25th became the official nationwide holiday honoring the medal and its recipients. The medal is the highest honor for military valor in action and nearly 3,500 3, people have been awarded the Medal of Honor. Just a few details about the format of this program before we get started. We will have a Q&A at the end. Please use the, the Q&A box on your screen if you have any questions. I will track those along the way and we will give some time for that at the end of the program. We will be recording this program today. If you have any technical difficulties or if you know someone who couldn't join us today, we will be posting the program on the Naval Parks YouTube page so that you can watch it later. We will send a link to everyone who has registered so that you have access to that as well. Our speaker today is Dr. Teresa Kaminsky. Dr. Kaminsky earned a PhD in history from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She is a professor emeritus who taught American history and women's history for 25 years in Wisconsin, where she currently resides. She's a full-time writer who has published books, including a trilogy of nonfiction books about American women in the Philippines during World War II, Prisoners in Paradise, American Women in the Wartime South Pacific, Citizen of Empire, Ethel Thomas Harold, an American in the Philippines, and Angels of the Underground. In June of last year, in 2020, she published her most recent book, Dr. Mary Walker's Civil War, One Woman's Journey to the Medal of Honor and the Fight for Women's Rights. On Dr. Kaminsky's website, she writes that she is fascinated by scrappy women caught up in extraordinary times, and Dr. Walker certainly fits into this category. Born in Oswego, New York in 1832, Walker overcame many social and political obstacles over the course of her life. For her work as a physician with the Union during the Civil War, Dr. Walker became and remains to this day the only woman to receive the Medal of Honor. Her wartime exploits were astonishing enough, but she was also a lifelong advocate of women's rights, which we will, we will hear about today from Dr. Kaminsky. And with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Teresa. So thank you for joining us today. Well, thanks so much, Courtney. I'm going to start sharing my screen now. Okay. So hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm especially pleased that uh, for my topic, Dr. Mary Walker, that we have this wonderful convergence of National Medal of Honor Day um, falling within Women's History Month. So this makes the, the perfect connection with who Dr. Mary Walker was as a person, um, her interest in serving in the military and her interest in equality and women's rights. And I think that uh, these two things very much went hand in hand with her uh, for, for her entire life. So as I um, move through this, this overview of her experiences, this is what I would like you all to keep in mind is that connection. Um, her, Mary Walker's deep belief in gender equality really drove her to get involved with the Civil War. And um, even before that, it um, helped make that decision to become a doctor, which was very unusual for a woman in the 19th century. And um, as Courtney mentioned, uh, Mary Edwards Walker was born and raised in Oswego, New York. 
um, when she was born in 1832, um, this was a time period of tremendous reform that was sweeping um, most of the northern states and especially New York, um, especially parts of central and western New York. Um, her parents, Alva and Vesta Walker, were known as being progressives or free thinkers. They were abolitionists. Uh, the Walker household was a stop on the Underground Railroad in the decades before the Civil War. Alva and Vesta were the ones who um, introduced their own children to the concept of equal gender rights. They promoted things like, um, well, not only abolition, but co-education. They believed very strongly in teaching boys and girls equally. They even had a, a school opened on their farm for neighborhood children. They believed in temperance. Uh, Mary Walker was a lifelong abstainer of alcohol. She believed it was harmful to anybody who drank. And um, this interest in reform did also involve women's rights issues, um, especially, and as we can see here in this early uh, photo of Mary Walker, we notice that she is in fact wearing trousers. Um, from a very young age, Mary Walker did adopt the style of dress by the late 1840s. This would be known as the bloomer costume, and it typically involved a woman wearing a pair of um, full-length trousers and then some kind of a shortened skirt or dress over it. And for the rest of her life, Mary Walker would wear this kind of outfit everywhere, uh, both in public and in private. And it was the, um, the public mode of dress that often got her into a little bit of trouble uh, throughout her adult years. But she was very committed to dress reform. And for Mary Walker, all of women's rights stemmed from this particular fashion issue. She did believe that traditional women's dress physically hampered women to the point of making equality with men impossible. So she never wavered from her belief that women should be able to dress in any manner that they believed appropriate. And th this belief especially in gender equality and women's rights was behind her decision to pursue a career in medicine. As I mentioned, um, this was very unusual for the 19th century. Some of you may have um, been hearing about a new book out. Um, I think it's called The Blackwell Sisters by Janice Nomura, um, talking about two other pioneers in uh, female medicine during the 19th century. And uh, Mary Walker was a, a rough contemporary of Elizabeth um, Blackwell. And um, Walker had, like women of the time, had a difficult um, time finding a, an accredited medical school that would even accept women as students. And she did finally find one in Syracuse, New York, uh, the Syracuse Medical College. Uh, this is not actually um, the Syracuse Medical College itself. This is the closest drawing I could come to it, but it probably looked something like this in the early to mid 1850s. It was a relatively small building, small program, but it was co-educational. And Mary Walker um, took the full course there back in the 19th century. Um, medical education often involved only about one or two years worth of study. Uh, Mary Walker was at Syracuse between 1853 and 1855, and she excelled there as a student. Uh, when she graduated in 1855, it was with honors. And while she was there, she met a fellow student named Albert Miller. They developed quite a close friendship and this um, extended after their graduation 
and um, they did end up getting married in 1855. And um, the marriage turned out to be relatively brief. The couple and uh, Mary Walker, for the most part, retained the use of the Walker name. Um, sometimes she did refer to herself as Walker Miller or Miller Walker, um, but both she and Albert Miller set up um, separate medical practices in Rome, New York, um, after their marriage in 1855. And Mary Walker, as what normally happened with female physicians at the time, she took on a practice that specialized in women and children. And she apparently was very happy with this. She was very happy with the whole setup until she learned that Albert Miller had been unfaithful and apparently repeatedly so uh, to the point where he had at least one child with another woman. And um, she decided to divorce him also a very unusual action for a woman to take in the 19th century, but she insisted that was not an appropriate marriage uh, in her mind and she wanted an end to it. And by the time she finally secured her divorce, um, the United States was at war. Um, and there is evidence that as soon as the war started, in 1861, Mary Walker got the idea of presenting herself um, for service with the United States Army. She did believe that she had quite a lot to offer in this fight to um, end slavery. And when she finally got her divorce issues wrapped up, she simply left New York and went directly to Washington, D.C and presented herself in the office of the Secretary of War and asked Simon Cameron for a commission in the United States Army. And this would be um, a pursuit of hers over the next several years. This was what she wanted, was to be an officially recognized member of the United States military, which at the time was very much hurting for qualified medical personnel. And Mary Walker had not only graduated from an accredited medical school, but she also had a few years of medical practice under her belt. So she believed she was every bit as qualified as any other doctor making his way to the Capitol or signing up with um, a particular troop to serve. So she, approached Cameron with very high hopes. And he, I think, was doubly startled to see her standing in his office because not only was she a woman asking for a military commission, but she was also a woman dressed in that bloomer costume. She was there in her trousers and long overskirt. And Cameron just didn't really know what to make of her other than to send her on her way saying um, it was not the practice of the United States Army to hire or to commission women. And he didn't really believe that women were qualified to be doctors. He suggested maybe she might be able to find a position as a nurse, but Mary Walker was very firm she was not a nurse, she was a doctor, and she wanted her services to be recognized as the doctor's services. So rather than taking that dismissal by Cameron out of hand, um, she stayed in Washington and she simply began going to um, different hospitals in the city and asking the surgeon in charge if she could work there. And she, what she was doing was volunteering her services. So she simply went from hospital to hospital and she finally um, got lucky when she presented herself um, at what was known as the Indiana Hospital. It was located in the um, Patent Office building 
And the doctor in charge was a man named Dr. J.N. Green. He was with the 19th Indiana Volunteers. And um, Green was particularly stretched to the limit by the time Mary Walker showed up. He had, lost, he had recently lost one of his um, medical doctors. He was very grateful when Mary Walker showed up and he said she was certainly welcome to stay and work there. He offered to pay her out of his own salary. That's how, um, how much he needed to have a qualified medical professional there. She turned down his offer. She thought it was very generous, but she figured he probably had a family he was also supporting. So she, um, she reiterated that she was willing to volunteer for services as long as she had a place to stay at the hospital and she could draw rations. Um, she was perfectly happy with room and board until something else could be worked out. And Dr. Green did agree to appeal on her behalf to the Surgeon General um, at, a at that time, a man by the name of Clement Finley. Um, so on her behalf, Green did approach um, both the Surgeon General, the Assistant Surgeon General, asking if Mary Walker couldn't be commissioned in the army to serve as a medical doctor. Um, all of these men, like Simon Cameron, um, turn down Walker's request. She remained with the Indiana Hospital for some time. Um, it was while she was working there that she did meet at least once with Dorothea Dix, who had been hired by the Army to serve as its superintendent of nurses. And um, it is important to note that although Dorothea Dix was one of the most well-known reformers in the early 19th century, um, particularly with what were called at the time um, insane asylums, um, hospitals that dealt with people who had emotional illnesses. Um, Dorothea Dix had no medical degree. She was not trained in medicine at all. She was a very skillful organizer. Um, she did visit the Indiana Hospital at least once, observed Mary Walker working there. The two women didn't get along particularly well. Uh, Mary Walker was very critical of the fact that um, Dix had no medical qualifications, and Dix did not like the idea of a woman doctor serving in one of those military hospitals. So there was really no sense of a larger sisterhood here based on circumstances. Mary Walker still thought very well of her own qualifications and um, not so much of Dix's approaches to medical care during the war. By 1862, Mary Walker was expanding her medical services into the field. And um, especially in the later part of 1862, she had moved out uh, beyond Washington, D.C. into the surrounding um, Virginia territory uh, areas that had been especially recently conquered by uh, the United States Army. She worked as um, what was known as a field surgeon, although she was not um, she was not a battlefield surgeon. We very rarely find Mary Walker in the heat of any active battle. She was usually more of a behind the lines practitioner. And for example, um, in late 1862, she, um, she was in Lacey House in Falmouth, uh, Virginia with Ambrose Burnside's troops. Uh, this is all in, um, in the wake of the Battle of Fredericksburg and um, Mary Walker had heard that there was a particular need for medical care there to uh, take care of the men who had been wounded or were suffering from diseases in the aftermath of that battle. And um, it was there at Lacey House that I'm pretty sure Mary Walker ran into or even met up with 
Clara Barton, who of course is probably one of the most well-known um, Civil War nurses. Uh, Clara Barton was there at the same time. And the American poet, Walt Whitman, who had received word that his brother had been wounded and was um, likely at Lacey House, um, both Barton and Whitman were there at the same time as Mary Walker. And um, I think it's entirely possible that they met and interacted with each other um, in December of 1862. We find Mary Walker on the move again um, between 1862 and 1863. Much of it initially um, with the Army of the Potomac. We do know that um, she was also at Gettysburg after the battle ended, but short, very shortly after the end of that battle. By 1863, we do find her um, in Tennessee. And this is where her situation with the army um, begins to change. Um, she was in Chattanooga and she did get to meet General George Thomas, who at the time was the head of the Army of the Cumberland. And Thomas apparently was extremely impressed with Mary Walker's medical services. Um, he really thought a lot of her abilities. And when Walker told him that she had been trying unsuccessfully to get a commission with the army, um, Thomas kept that in mind and he heard in early 1864 that um, a unit from Ohio was looking for a new surgeon. And he immediately thought that Dr. Walker would be the perfect person to take that position. And he had in mind, though, not a commission. Um, as much as as much as Thomas appreciated her services, he did understand that there was no precedent for a woman uh, serving in the military. He had in mind to officially appoint her, though, as an employee of the United States Army. But to take that position. Mary Walker would have to undergo a formal examination by a medical board. And this was also fairly standard practice for physicians who wanted to serve with the United States Army. Their qualifications had to be vetted. Um, that was done through um, a testing process. And so there was a medical examining board convened in March of 1864. It was headed by a man uh, named uh, Glover Perrin. We see him in this photo. He's the one uh, in front of the arrow there. And um, Perrin convened this medical board, which was made up of a lot of doctors that um, were about Mary Walker's own age. Many of them had not had the kind of um, medical experience she had had. Nevertheless, they were the ones sitting in judgment on her. And most of them were not interested in having women serving as doctors. And um, there are two very different stories about what happened during that medical review. Um, Mary Walker claimed that all of the questioning was unfair. Um, at the end of the examination, the board determined that she actually had no more medical knowledge than an average housewife or possibly a trained nurse. And they didn't see any reason for hiring her on as um, paid medical staff. So their, their finding was in opposition to General Thomas's recommendation, but he was the general and he actually just overrode 
the medical board's finding, and he hired her on um, her, her official position, her official title was contract assistant surgeon to the 52nd Ohio Volunteers. Um, they were stationed at the time in Northern Georgia at a place called Lee and Gordon's Mills. So they were in territory only very recently occupied by the United States Army and in an area that was still contested by Confederate troops. So that other phrase I have up there, and spy, um, also signifies what Thomas believed Walker's other valuable contribution could be. Um, as she was moving out from Lee and Gordon's Mills, which is where the 52nd Ohio volunteers were stationed, um, he encouraged her to go out and treat the civilian population which hadn't had medical services in quite a while because of the disruptions of the war. And as she was out in the countryside, she could gather information about Confederate troop positions and movements. And it was a dangerous job. And she often went out unaccompanied. So she was often out alone you can see by her manner of dress that she would be looked upon with some suspicion by people who encountered her. And she did often travel with some kind of weapon though um, to protect herself. And it was dangerous work. And Thomas knew that. Um, her commanding officer, uh, Colonel Daniel McCook at Lee and Gordon's Mills, he knew that too but she was willing to do this anyway. And it didn't take long before she was actually detained by Confederate troops while she was out on one of her medical missions. And she was taken as a prisoner of war. She was transferred to Castle Thunder in Richmond, Virginia, where she spent a few months as a Confederate prisoner of war. And during her time there, she, um, she suffered some deprivation like any prisoner would. Um, she was denied the chance to practice medicine. Her own health deteriorated fairly rapidly. And she was finally freed in August of 1864 in a prisoner of war exchange. So um, she was considered to be an official enough part of the military that um, she was exchanged for Confederate prisoners um, and she was given her release in August. And after that happened, um, she made her way directly to Washington, D.C. She knew the war was not over. Her contributions to the war were not over. She asked for a new posting. She did hope at this point that her time as a prisoner of war might make the army commission her. Um, General Sherman turned her down this time. She was assigned to um, a female military prison in Louisville, Kentucky. And she moved on from there to a refugee hospital in Clarksville, Tennessee. And she was in this military service uh, without being an official member of the military until the war ended in 1865. By that point, um, at the end of the war, more and more people had heard about her service and there were questions about how to mark this rather astonishing turn of events for a female doctor during the Civil War. And President Andrew Johnson asked the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, um, to look into the matter. If, um, if Stanton thought that perhaps Mary Walker should be given a commission, or if there was some other way of marking and honoring her service. 
And Stanton asked the judge advocate general, a man by the name of Joseph Holt, to look into the matter. And Holt wrote up an extensive investigation set of recommendations. And um, he concluded that probably a commission was not a good idea. He didn't see any precedent for a woman receiving a commission, but he did think that according to the current language for the Medal of Honor, he believed Mary Walker was qualified to receive that particular distinction. So in November of 1865, um, she was awarded the Medal of Honor. Uh, the, the citation for the award does note in particular her patriotic zeal in her services and her hardships as a prisoner of war. Um, there was a brief ceremony um, in January of 1866 for this, but for the most part, this was, um, you know, this was not a huge public event, but it did stand to serve a precedent for a woman being awarded this national honor. And Mary Walker was understandably very proud of it. Um, she remains to this day the only woman to receive that particular award. And as you can see in this photograph, um, she, she wore that, that medal. And um, as we'll see in a few minutes, she continued to wear it even after she really wasn't supposed to. But in the aftermath of the war, um, she was very involved with veterans issues. We do know that she helped uh, a variety of veterans um, apply for pensions. She herself received um, a pension beginning in 1865. Um, she would request adjustments to this throughout most of her life. Um, the amount did, did tend to go up. Um, she also did apparently attend some veterans reunions. I couldn't find um, any images from the one she actually attended in Ohio in 1879. This is, um, this is from one a decade later, but she did attend um, some veterans reunions, particularly this one in 1879, um, where she was an honored guest. Um, she was not just an attendee, but she was up on the stage with other military veterans um, of the service. And so she, she kind of occupied this unprecedented position because of the awarding of this medal. And um, she was understandably very proud of that for the rest of her life. But the other issue that consumed her post-war activities had to do more broadly with women's rights issues, and in particular with women's suffrage or women's voting rights. And during the 1860s, she did get involved with the organized campaign for women's right to vote. Um, we see here two of the leaders of the American Equal Rights Association. Um, many of you might be familiar with the names, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who we see uh, on the left. In the middle, of course, her political partner, Susan B. Anthony, who would become major leaders of the women's suffrage movement. Um, on the far right, we see Belva Lockwood, an attorney, um, also a very unusual occupation for women in this time period. Um, Lockwood became a friend of Mary Walker's. She was also very active in the suffrage movement in Washington, D.C. Um, Lockwood and Mary Walker involved in another suffrage group called the Universal Franchise Association, uh, franchise being another term for voting. And um, these women 
did very much see that issues of citizenship were tied to voting rights. And of course, these were big issues in the aftermath of the Civil War because of the emancipation of the enslaved population. And um, there were a lot of questions about voting rights for African Americans in the wake of the Civil War. And women like Stanton and Anthony and Mary Walker believed that adult women should be part of that movement to broaden voting rights throughout the United States. So this emphasis on equal rights, universal franchise or universal voting rights. This was something that Mary Walker and other activists very much believed in because for them, they saw it as a way of dealing with both uh, racial equality and gender equality all at once. But we can't forget that there were still some very strong racial and racist attitudes at the time. And we do see Mary Walker engaging in this for a very brief period of time. When it looked to her like women might be shut out of the conversation for voting rights, she did for a very brief period of time in 1868 promote what she called the White Women's Franchise Association. She organized this group in Washington, D.C. during the spring and summer of 1868. And it was her reaction against this larger national push for voting rights for African-American men. Um, as you can see, it was very short-lived. She did try to promote this notion that white women were more qualified to vote. Um, largely, I think she tried to tie this to education, um, that white women would be an educated body of voters, and so they, they deserved the vote. Um, but you can see that this argument didn't really take hold. And when Walker realized that this was not really something that was helpful in the overall conversation. She simply allowed this association to dissolve and she never really talked about it for the rest of her life. She just um, continued her work on suffrage in general. And she was an early adherent to a women's suffrage strategy um, that would be known as the new departure. And this was very popular in the 1860s and 1870s. And it was based on um, a very creative reading of the 14th Amendment. And we see here that the 14th Amendment um, simply says that in the first section that people who are born or naturalized in the United States are citizens. And um, the new departure interpreted that along with the second section of the 14th Amendment that raised the issue of voting rights. Um, the new departure kind of conveniently ignored the passage in section two that specified male inhabitants um, and said, well, anybody who is a United States citizen age 21 or older um, should be entitled to vote. And this is what Mary Walker and for a time other suffrage, women's suffrage advocates based their claim on was this uh, very creative reading of the 14th Amendment. And they would argue then that the 14th Amendment 
gave women as well as men uh, the right to vote. And um, she, of course, and the rest of the women with this new departure strategy were on very um, shaky legal grounds. And in fact, um, the United States Supreme Court would reject this argument in the 1870s. But in pursuit of women's voting rights, uh, Mary Walker did work with um, the women's suffrage organizations that were organized uh, very successfully so in the 1860s and 1870s, in particular, um, the National Woman Suffrage Association, which um, later merged with the American Woman Suffrage Association to become the National American Woman Suffrage Association. This was the group that Stanton and Anthony um, headed and um, pushed for, ultimately pushed for a either state, state by state laws allowing women the right to vote or ultimately a um, constitutional amendment that would guarantee those provisions. And um, sorry, I got a little bit ahead of myself. Um, Mary Walker did publish what she called, it was a small pamphlet called the crowning constitutional argument in which she did outline her reasons for believing that the 14th amendment guaranteed women the right to vote. Um, this became, uh, this was briefly adopted by the um, National American Women Suffrage Association. It proved not to be a, an effective tactic. Um, after a while, other suffragists abandoned this new departure. Mary Walker was maybe one of, maybe a person of one who adhered to it, wouldn't give it up. Um, this did cause her to actually get kicked out of the mainstream suffrage movement by the end of the 1890s. Her, her membership was formally revoked. Um, she was asked not to come to speak at these meetings. She was perceived of as too divisive of a character. Um, although she did, um, she did on her own continue to go out and um, make speeches, do everything that she could to call attention to women's voting rights. And um, when the, the women's suffrage campaign was starting to make some headway uh, during the 1910s, this of course coincided with the outbreak of the First World War in 1914 in Europe. And this prompted Congress and the United States military to take another look at um, the Medal of Honor. And in 1916, uh, Congress passed this Medal of Honor role designation and um, set up a review board where everybody who had been awarded um, Medal of Honor um, their file was reviewed to see if those medals were appropriately awarded. And um, in the course of that, Mary Walker had her Medal of Honor rescinded. Uh, this is Lieutenant General uh, Nelson Miles, who was head of that military review board. Mary Walker was one of 911 people who had their medals rescinded, um, often for a variety of reasons, but mostly coming down in Mary Walker's case. Um, the reason was that she had not been engaged in combat. And so she was not entitled to have this award. So it was rescinded. Um, she was, the army requested that she send her medal back. She refused to do this. This is why you always see photographs of her even later in life um, still wearing the medal. She refused to 
acknowledge the legitimacy of the review board to strip her of that medal. So she continued to wear it. Um, during World War I, she had plans to work for the Red Cross. Um, she was probably making her way to um, formalize new volunteer opportunities for herself when she was in Washington, D.C. and she tripped and fell, she became ill and um, she ended up dying in 1919. In the 1970s, there was considerable movement to restore Mary Walker's award. Um, these efforts had been going on almost from the time that medical or that review board stripped her of the honor. Um, there were people, uh, most of whom were related to her in some distant way, uh, working on her behalf behind the scenes to see if that honor couldn't be restored. Um, as early as the 1920s, you see efforts on her behalf. And it really isn't until the 1970s that this gains a great deal of momentum. And I think that um, much of that had to do with the fact that there was a thriving women's rights movement again um, in the 1960s and the 1970s. More women were serving in the military. Um, those barriers had, had gradually fallen through both of the world wars. And it just wasn't um, seen as that unusual to find a woman in military uniform. So the whole issue was revisited in the 1970s and um, Congress had opened up hearings, uh, but before Congress itself could take action, um, there was an army board for the correction of military records that had convened in 1977 and had reviewed Mary Walker's case and decided that based on her services during the Civil War, based on the criteria for the medal as it existed at the time, um, the, the corrections board ordered that the medal be restored to her. So in conclusion, um, just a little bit about her legacy before we open this up for any questions that you might have. Um, certainly, what Mary Walker did throughout her lifetime, um, American women did get the right to vote. Uh, this, this happened finally as the result of a constitutional amendment. Um, we see women at the ballot box uh, going to vote in 1920. Uh, we also find that uh, formal official positions in the military for women began to open up in the First World War. This was vastly expanded um, through the Second World War. And today, of course, we do see women uh, even training for combat positions in the military. So this is something that Mary Walker had been pushing for a very long time. And of course, that uh, stunning photograph of Catherine Hepburn in a pair of pants. Uh, Mary Walker was certainly um, an early pioneer in women's fashions and not, not just for fashion's sake, but for the right of a woman to decide what she wanted to wear, um, that this should not be up to society, that should, this should be an individual decision and an individual right. So um, I think this is where we are in terms of Mary Walker's legacy, women voting, women wearing slacks, women in the military. And um, I would like to thank everybody for being here today, um, especially the organizers of this event. Um, I also understand that Talking Moves Books uh, in Buffalo has um, stocked copies of uh, Mary Walker Civil War. So thank you to them. And thanks for everybody who's here this afternoon to hear about Mary Walker, and um, I would like to just open it up if anybody has any questions. We have some time left. 
Yes, thank you. We, um, thank you, Dr. Kaminsky. That was a really great talk. And we do have a few questions, um, a few through the, the Q&A chat. So thank you for everybody who has put those forward. Um, my first question is, what, what was it about Dr. Mary Walker and her story that first drew you to conduct the research and write this book? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think that a lot of it has to do with um, just my own uh, background with teaching. I'd, I'd run across references to Mary Walker um, in other contexts. And um, actually, I was, I was working on another book, which I'm still finishing up now. And uh, an editor at that publishing house had been working on Medal of Honor stories and she had come across Mary Walker and wanted a biography. And I just, I guess, happened to be in the right place at the right time. But Mary Walker's story was one I was very much interested in because I had done other projects about women in war, uh, especially women uh, during World War II. So this was a, a different war for me to get involved in. And um, I was very happy to take up this charge to um, write a book about Mary Walker. It's not that there hadn't been any others um, published about her, but it had been quite a while. Um, so this was the opportunity to take a fresh look at her story, especially in conjunction with um, women's rights issues, the changing role of women in the military, I was just really interested in pursuing those issues. Great. And um, we had a question from Rob who wanted to know, why do you feel people know more about Clara Barton's story than Mary Walker? Um, that's a really good question. And I do think that this ties into just how pervasive our perceptions are about what a woman should and shouldn't do. Uh, Clara Barton and Mary Walker did get along um, and, and I think they were very cordial to each other, but they were very different in their approaches to what they did. And you can see, um, Clara Barton just presented herself more in the tradition of the 19th century woman. And um, she was perhaps more diplomatic in how she dealt with everybody. Mary Walker wasn't. Um, she was very forthright. She wore pants. And this, uh, it, it's hard to overstate how startling this was to people in the nine, especially in the first half or so of the 19th century, to see a woman just out in public all the time wearing pants. So I think that um, Clara Barton adhered more closely to what were considered to be standards of 19th century womanhood, and Mary Walker did not. And in fact, as, as Mary Walker got older, she, she cut her hair um, she, and, and then wearing short hair in addition to slack, um, this all kind of fed into this image of her as being a very untraditional woman. Great. I know I've seen the term referred to her as a physician and as a surgeon. Is there a difference in this time period between the two terms? And we did have a question on what specific medical procedures did she do? Um, I know that, and, and this is interesting, and I'm not, I guess I should say, I'm not a total expert on this, on the medical aspects. I did have to educate myself quite quickly on them, and I probably have not reached the expert level. But, um, and, and even today though, you have, you have like general practice doctors and you have surgeons. So there is um, a recognition that surgery where you're cutting into somebody is a specialty. And Mary Walker 
didn't do much of that actual surgery. She, I, I, I've seen some accounts where she was assisting with surgeries. She didn't do a whole lot of that herself. She was more of the physician type, um, a, a treating doctor, illnesses. Um, she could treat wounds. Um, but as, as far as being in the operating room where she would be a surgeon, she didn't do it that often. But I, I think that was a part of her medical school training, but it didn't turn out to be an emphasis. And I think especially after her imprisonment in 1864, it inter, uh, she had problems with her eyesight. And so um, especially after 1864, she was reluctant to be a surgeon in terms of medical care because she worried about her skill and, and her eyesight. So I think that's the, the distinction there. Although with the way the medical profession was in the 19th century, there was still a lot of evolution at the time. This whole business of qualifications um, the American Medical Association forming and becoming more powerful in the 19th century. All of this speaks to an ongoing process and Mary Walker was there for part of that. Um, and certainly after the war was over with, she didn't practice medicine as often as maybe she would have if she hadn't had that experience as a prisoner um, and with problems with her eyesight. Great, thank you. I had a question, we have a question from uh, Dan that says um, she wore a uniform for the Civil War. You talk about her wearing a Union uniform. Um, is, do you have any information about what rank or insignia she used as part of that? Um, she made it herself. Um, this, was, this, was not a, uh, this was not a uniform that she was, given. Um, she had to do this all by herself. And this, this does speak to this, um, you know, it, it's not technically correct to call it an in-between status because she clearly was a civilian doctor working for the military. But she was, you know, when she was at Lee and Gordon's Mills, that was a union military encampment. So she wanted to look like a union officer, but she also knew she did not have the official rank. So she was mindful of that. And she didn't want to be accused of passing herself off as something that she wasn't. So she she comes very close. She she gets kind of the basic styling down, but she she doesn't pass herself off as an officer, although she did understand, of course, that doctors in the army had, I guess, the equivalent of an officer's rank. So she did consider herself to be on par with them, but she did understand that distinction between civilian and military, but she did like some of that military pageantry. She, um, you know, she liked having that homemade uniform of hers and um, she wore it very proudly. Great. Uh, and I have another question from Tracy. I know we're, we'll have maybe two more questions. Um, Tracy wants to know um, specifically about her later career as a lecturer. Could you talk a little bit about what led her to go on the lecture circuit and um, when she was talking, when she was speaking, did she speak more about her wartime experiences or mainly promote women's suffrage and women's rights? Um, yeah, that's a great question. She, I think she took to the lecture circuit um, for a combination of reasons. One, of course, is she really believed in women's suffrage. So this was a, an honest and sincere cause for her. And she did see it as a way of promoting even broader women's rights because certainly voting was one part of that, but she was an active advocate of women being able to serve in the military, which she hadn't been technically able to do, but she thought it should be a right and an opportunity for women. Um, 
so she she went on a lecture circuit as a way of earning money and this was a very uh, this was a very common thing in the 19th century a variety of lecturers traveling around as experts in one thing or the other and i think she often gauged her audience you know did she want to talk about the wartime service did she want to talk about the women's suffrage movement? Did she want to somehow tie these two things together? Um, she would be very creative and very responsive to her particular audience. Um, she sometimes ran into um, not entirely friendly audiences. Uh, she had a lot to cope with when she was out on the lecture circuit, but it was a way for her, for her to make a contribution to the suffrage movement, which was increasingly sidelining her because they, people like Stanton and Anthony just found her too odd. Um, so she was kind of sidelined at the same time, she was still sort of embraced because she was promoting women's suffrage. So that uh, people like Stanton and Anthony thought was a good thing but often the way she was doing it, and especially because she was wearing pants while she was doing it, this caused um, still some controversy within the women's suffrage movement. So Mary Walker was often an outlier because of that, but you know, she just, um, she would fund these, these talks herself. She would sometimes solicit donations. That's how she paid her way around and when she got tired or when she ran out of money, she would come home for a while. Um, and that's just how she made her way in those post four years. Excellent. Well, I think we have time for just one last question. Um, and this is something that I'm interested in. Did you find anything during your research that was especially surprising about Dr. Walker that maybe you didn't expect to find before you started this process? or the project? Um, boy, surprising. I guess, I guess I was surprised at how dogged she was. Um, and I, I do mean that in a good way. She was relentless in her pursuit for the vote. And I, I think that the, that whole new departure thing is a good example of that. Other suffragists had supported that strategy saying, oh, the 14th Amendment all, already gives us the right to vote. So we'll just go and vote. And after a while, when it didn't work for them, they gave up on it. But Mary Walker didn't. She, when she got an idea, when she believed in something, she believed in it all the way. And so she always believed that the 14th Amendment already gave women voting rights. And she was in some ways just kind of annoyed at times that she had to go out and convince other people that this was true. So I, I think her, her determination and her willingness to get arrested, um, she, when she appeared in pants in public, in some locations, this violated local ordinances and she would find herself arrested and taken to jail simply because of what she wore. And she would fight these charges and she would just always say, because she was a woman, any clothing that she wore in fact became women's clothing. So she could see no reason why she was constantly harassed for the way she dressed. So um, these kinds of things, her, her arguments, I always found interesting and in some cases surprising. Um, she, she just was a very astonishing woman in many ways. And I hope I, I kind of tapped into at least a little bit of that um, so that you'll be interested in, in finding out more about her because she, she was very single-minded once she got a goal in her head 
and women's suffrage was one of those things. And I know that later in her life, she was ill. Um, she probably was unable to follow the news. So when she died in 1919, she may not have been aware that her, her goal for women's suffrage was just about to come true. Um, but I think that maybe without her, it might have taken a little bit longer. So I, I do wanna at least give her a little bit of that credit in the suffrage campaign, as well as to acknowledge what she did with her medical services during the war where they were very much needed. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Kaminsky. This was a really great talk, very fascinating. And I, I know I learned a lot from your book, so I appreciate that. And I also wanna thank Talking Leaves Books here in Buffalo for partnering with us to sell, um, to sell the book. We definitely encourage you to purchase it and hope you feel inspired to, to learn a little bit more and to read, um, to read it. As I mentioned before, we will be posting this talk on our YouTube page and we will send a link out to everyone who has registered so that you can see it there. This was the first program in our virtual speaker series of 2021. I encourage you to visit our website at buffalonavalpark.org to learn more and sign up for our mailing list to be notified about all of our programs and events. We, we truly appreciate your support and we look forward to hopefully welcoming you to the Buffalo Naval Park in the near future, in, in person, hopefully. Um, thank you again for joining us today. That is the end of our program. So thank you again. Well, thanks, Courtney. And thanks for everybody for being here. Um, I, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook. Anybody, if you have any other questions, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm always happy to talk about Mary Walker and um, anything having to do with women in the military, really. So I do appreciate everybody taking the time, um, Courtney and, and everybody there who's helped organize this. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.